uh, as we heard in the Nordics and in the Baltics, we are uh, far ahead when it comes to technology and financial tools. Uh, but it doesn't look like that uh, in every country. So uh, I would like to hear more about that from you, Anesha. Uh, the scene is yours. Welcome. Great. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this event. It's really wonderful. And uh, I'm an academic and especially a precarious early career researcher. So yeah, it's really great that you invited me. And I've already learned a lot today, uh, especially about how cashlessness discourses have developed over the last years in Sweden, which is a country where I lived and worked between 2017 and 2019. Uh, but for today's discussion, I will take you to a world really very far away from Sweden in terms of its uh, cashless ecosystems. And my speech will not be as optimistic about technology. Uh, sociologists like myself, we love to complicate things. And from our research, what came up is how something which is fundamentally created to connect is equally capable of excluding. Uh, so my contribution stems from the work that I carried out with a dear friend who is also a dear colleague. Her name is Jilet Sam and she works in India as a young professor of sociology at the Indian Institute of Technology uh, in Kanpur. And initially, so around 2017, basically, we were both interested in exploring the political discourses and social consequences of cashlessness in India. And what especially uh, picked our interest was the demonetization of two high value Indian currency notes, which uh, declared these notes valueless overnight on 8th of November, 2016. Um, so uh, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, who is still the Prime Minister now, in a national televised address explained that to break the grip of corruption and black money, the Indian government had decided that the 500 rupee and 1000 rupee currency notes, and these formed about 85% of all the cash in circulation in the economy, uh, would no longer be a legal tender from midnight of 8 November, 2016. How do I move to the next one? Yeah, okay. Um, so the prime minister's speech echoed uh, economic and policy level discourses, which attribute cash to underground economy. Um, as you know, Harvard economist Kenneth Rogoff noted cash as a curse which ails the world today. And he argued that cash is used for tax evasion, corruption, financing terrorism, the drug trade and human trafficking. And many of these concerns were also reflected in the prime minister's speech on 7th November. Um, shaped by a burgeoning anti-cash agenda at the international level, the idea of cashlessness gained prominence in Indian policy and governance circles with a shift towards becoming uh, what they called faceless, paperless, cashless, uh, that was identified as a key role of Digital India, which was the government of India's flagship program launched in 2015, just before a year before the demonetization policy. And the Indian demonetization experiment, the largest of its kind in a democratic country, too, gathered a considerable global attention as a push or even a jolt towards cashlessness and a dig digital economy. And I think I can already see a major difference with the Swedish experience because of course in Sweden, the change was a lot more gradual and the infrastructures were already in place. So uh, over the last years, uh, experts, analysts and activists uh, opinions have been divided on how effective this particular policy move was uh, several of the critics of this policy, including top economists, in, which uh, include the ex-Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and the ex-governor of the Central Reserve Bank of India and the ex-chief economist of the IMF, Raghuram Rajan. Uh, they have criticized this um, policy. Uh, some of them have pointed out how limited access to digital infrastructure could negatively affect small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as other sections of India's heavily cash-based economy. 
uh, many have a question backed by sound banking and financial data, how effective a move of this disruptive nature was in actually curbing corruption because almost 98% uh, of the cash money was deposited back into the banks. Uh, uh, while fighting corruption was used as one of the most vocal reasons to move towards cashlessness, we of course see another very strong motivation for this move. And that of course brings us to uh, the, the very um, obvious uh, discussion that we have been having, which is financial inclusion. And that echoes, of course, global developmental agenda from international organizations. So financial inclusion, as you know very well, uh, is closely tied with the realization of multiple SDGs uh, 2030. And these conversations emphasize the inclusion, of course, of digital technologies, especially mobile money and a move away from cash. Of course, the Kenyan e-PESA ex example is very well known. In a 2014 report, the McKinsey Global Institute identified digital payments as one of 12 empowering and disruptive technologies that could improve the standard of living for Indians across the board. Uh, in fact, following the policy trajectory of the Government of India on financial inclusion, we see that the first step towards enabling uh, digital payments and cashlessness ecosystems was the creation of bank accounts for the unbanked. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation notes that between 2014 and 2017, the percentage of Indian population with bank accounts had risen from 54 to 78%. Um, the following year, the government, as I said, 2015, uh, they launched the Digital India Initiative, which focused on developing digital infrastructure with the aim of rapid transformation affecting many sectors of the society. And this policy also led to the introduction of apps and digital payment interfaces developed by government ministries in our case to facilitate online payments through internet banking, credit and debit cards. However, of course, and this is where the sociologist kicks in, uh, as I said, um, the government focus on enhancing digital payment services must also be seen and read and considered in the light of user facts from India as uh, the critical infrastructural requirements and basic know-how of technology even at times are unable, unavailable to many sections of the society for a variety of socioeconomic and cultural reasons. And as we, as we noticed uh, through our research in the Indian scenario, policy and technology design often do not take into account the considerations and constraints of end users. They tend to be top down and agnostic. Uh, for instance, if we consider access to money through the lens of gender, which was an obvious choice for us while doing the research, we encountered some striking paradoxes between envisioned and actual outcomes of financial inclusion efforts. So media outlets have reported that the gender gap in opening accounts in India has been reduced. Findex, as you know, the World Bank Index for Financial Inclusion estimated that in 2017, 77% of Indian women owned a bank account against, wait for it, 43% in 2014 and only 26% in 2011. If this basic measure of financial inclusion is taken into consideration, yes, we could say women are more financially included than before, but however, and this is very important, many of these accounts uh, lay dormant. And uh, in a more focused micro level study, sociological study that we did, on uh, with informal and semi-formal women workers in a Northern Indian state, we saw that women's use of their own bank accounts declined when uh, debit cards were issued to them. And these tended to be controlled by their male relatives. Of course, in their world, mobile payments, et cetera, did not exist at all. And we are not even still talking about the poorest women of India. We're talking about a median. Um, so those, while government reports suggest the volume of digital payments has increased since 2016, 
the above research uh, that is our research suggests um, that this does not always translate to the desired diversification of the user base and which is of course crucial when we are talking about financial inclusion it cannot just be numbers it has to also happen uh, horizontally um, so then uh, what I want to conclude with basically is that even if there is the noble intent, as it were, of going cashless and embracing digital payments, it is important and extremely important for that matter to unpack the legal, economic, social and technological concerns which impact the design and the experience of cashlessness, as we see, of course, in the Indian context. And of course, for future research, because as we know, most of this literature academically is still coming from the global north and also the recommendations, uh, the institutions which recommend, they are also again from mostly the global north. Uh, so for future research, comparative studies cutting across national and regional boundaries could pave the way for a more human-centered approach to designing cashlessness and taking into account social, cultural, and of course, educational variables too. And with that, I stop. Many thanks, Anisha.